Hi, and welcome to the 2014 Rookie Orientation version of the LPGA Anti-Doping Webinar. My name is Josh Kane, and I am the Senior Counsel of the LPGA. Now, one of my job responsibilities is running the LPGA's Anti-Doping Program. And part of that job includes providing some basic education to each class of rookies that comes through the LPGA. So while the LPGA Anti-Doping Protocol is very comprehensive and about 65 pages long. My intent today is to keep this presentation concise and to the point. Essentially, I want to cover a few key topic areas that every LPGA member should know about the LPGA's anti-doping program. With that said, first, uh, as part of my roadmap, I, I want to talk about uh, the importance of drug testing in sports, particularly in golf. Then I'll review some of the resources available uh, that we put out there to help you guys comply with the program. Then I'll discuss some of the LPGA's banned substances, the concept of strict liability and therapeutic use exemptions, the types of testing that you might encounter on the LPGA tour, violations of the program, basically what not to do, penalties, and then I'll finish up with some information on supplements and a few key questions on the testing process. All right, so as you'll see throughout this presentation, uh, I'm gonna review some of the resources that we make available to help you comply with the obligations of the members in our, our anti-doping protocol. Uh, but to start off, uh, if you have any questions on, on this presentation, or if you have any questions on any parts of the uh, protocol or banned substances, uh, products that you might wanna take in the future, um, always feel free to contact me uh, 24 hours a day seven days a week. My uh, information's on this slide. Again, my name's Josh Kane, Senior Counsel of the LPGA. The phone number is 386-274-6284. Cell phone is 386-405-4633. And my email is josh, J-O-S-H dot Kane, K-A-N-E, at LPGA dot com. Okay, so drug testing of pro athletes. Uh, really for the LPGA, there's four primary goals. Uh, first one is protection and preservation of fair competition. And really, uh, when it comes down to it, if you have 144 or fewer than 143 are participating cleanly and doing it the right way, and, and one person is using banned drugs to get a competitive edge or to elevate their performance, the goal is to find that one person cheating and penalize them so that the collective interest of the entire membership, the rest of the membership, is, is protected um, and that your playing field is leveled. Second um, is to protect the health of players, and really when it comes down to it, discourage drug use that can ultimately be detrimental to a player's health. And so to protect the, the, the LPGA product and its players and ensure that its best players can have a long, uh, meaningful career, um, it's definitely in, in everyone's interest uh, to not use banned drugs because they are detrimental to your health. Third, golf in the Olympics. Um, from an international perspective, really, um, a, a sport is not credible unless it has a legitimate anti-doping program. And so uh, for golf to get into the Olympics in 2016, it was important that, that all golf properties really uh, install a, a credible drug testing program uh, that would ensure a, a level playing field. And lastly, the spirit of sport, really, this one uh, links perfectly with golf. You know, the integrity of a game like golf, uh, a game based on honor and honesty, um, to really celebrate what, what golf and what sport is about. You know, the dedication, hard work, you know, the, the discipline, honest, honesty, uh, respect for your competitors, um, preserve that spirit of what golf is about and what sports is about. And then also, lastly, um, at this point in your careers, you guys are elite athletes and, and undoubtedly role models for young athletes and for young girls. And um, because of that, you, you have a significant impact on young athletes who, who look up to you and aspire to be like you. All right, so as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to go through some of the LPGA anti doping resources as part of this presentation. Uh, but just so everyone knows, um, the key documents that make up the LPGA's anti-doping program are available on 
both uh, LPGA.com uh, and on the LPGA Player Extranet. So on LPGA.com, um, if you go on the main page and scroll down to the bottom under the, uh, the center um, column, uh, there's a heading that says anti-doping information. Um, and if you click on that, it'll take you to a separate page that has uh, the OPJ protocol, the prohibited list, which has the banned substances, the TUE application, which we'll get into in a little while, uh, permitted medications, which are we'll also get into, which are medications that are have been approved and cleared for your use, frequently asked questions, and then some more information as well. Um, also, if, if if you're ever on the OPJ site and uh, you want to get to these these documents, you can always type in doping or uh, in, in the search function at the top right hand corner of LPGA.com and that'll get you to the right spot as well. So as we uh, move through some of these slides, one of the key areas of any anti-doping program is the prohibited substances list. And that list is available on LPGA.com and on a wallet card that we'll talk about later in, in other areas too. Um, it's definitely uh, worthwhile to have that list uh, handy and with you um, at all times. Um, but when the LPGA developed this list uh, back in 2007, um, we, we really looked at two two areas um, to determine what what should be on our ban list. And so for us, we looked at performance enhancement and uh, negative health effects. And on the performance enhancement side, we looked at a, a, a lot of different ways you could enhance your performance by taking various drugs. Some of the key areas we looked at were uh, drugs that would help um, increase your muscle mass, your strength, your speed, um, improve recovery after long uh, workouts or, or training sessions. You know, drugs that would uh, improve your concentration or alertness, your focus, especially um, golf can be grueling if you have you know, four days of competition and back-to-back-to-back -back -to -back tournaments. Um, and also we looked at drugs that also on the, kind of the flip side um, could reduce your adrenaline or help you um, help with you know, common effects. Um, and one of the areas within that is helping reduce hand tremors, uh, especially for cutting purposes. And also we looked at um, drugs that would cause you know, negative health effects. Um, and so some of the negative health effects with drugs that are on our list now, which are they're all severe, um, you know, rage, hair loss, blood clots, kidney damage, um, high blood pressure, higher instances of, uh, of strokes, you know, depression, uh, acne, uh, just a lot of different things that are associated from a negative health standpoint with use of, of our banned drugs. Also important are LPGA prohibited methods. And there are two uh, key areas here. Um, one would be drugs or other methods that alter the integrity or validity of a urine sample. And the second is uh, use of a masking agent um, to basically mask or cover up the use of another banned drug. So the first one, um, using something to alter the integrity or validity of a sample. Um, an example here in other sports in the past that's been used is um, putting chemicals in their hands so that when you produce a urine sample, um, the, year, the urine sample that's sent to the laboratory is compromised and that the laboratory can't issue a result because it doesn't meet the, the high standards uh, necessary to analyze a, a urine sample. Uh, the second um, area here is masking agents and um, it, you know, basically using a drug to cover up the use of another drug. A good example here is uh, Manny Ramirez in Major League Baseball, you know, a, a 250 pound plus uh, guy using a woman's fertility drug, you know, absolutely no therapeutic or medical purpose for taking a woman's fertility drug, but he took it to hide the presence or cover up the presence of a steroid. Uh, so that would be an example of a masking agent. And uh, prohibited methods are, are banned under the LPGA's program and uh, but it results in a, a violation of the program, just like use of a banned drug. So we talked about uh, LPGA prohibited substances and methods, but separate from that are uh, drugs of abuse and recreational drugs like uh, marijuana, oxycodone, morphine, PCP. Um, these are drugs that, that don't enhance your performance um, but are, are harmful 
ultimately through health and, and uh, are harmful to the LPGA's brand. These uh, these drugs of abuse are uh, are not considered uh, violations under the LPGA's anti doping program, but um, are still subject to a penalty under the uh, player conduct regulations, uh, which we'll review it. So as we discussed in the, the first slide, uh, one of the key concepts of any anti-deafening program is strict liability. And basically what this means is that, that each athlete is uh, responsible for everything that goes into our body. And that intent doesn't matter. So if you are selected for technical tournament and um, steroids come back in your your urine sample. It doesn't matter whether you intended to use those steroids or whether they somehow appeared in your urine sample. Um, the fact that they're in your urine sample alone means that you're guilty of a doping violation under the uh, anti-doping protocol. So the, the key concept here is um, that you know, despite whether you go to your doctor and you get a prescription or whether you go to a, a, a local pharmacy and, and pick up some type of medical product or you go to GNC and uh, pick up a supplement or you know you go to um, Bed Bath & Beyond and get some type of clean uh, or, or even if you're out on the driving range and somebody offers you a free product you always have to ask yourself and have this mentality of does what I'm taking have a banned substance in it? That's the key question. Um, so it, it's a difficult obligation uh, but one that's required of all professional athletes who, who are involved in the anti-doping program and so what we've done um, is, is provide some resources really to help you uh, comply with that, that obligation. And so the question here is, how do you determine if a drug is permitted or prohibited? Um, so the, the key thing here is, is uh, with any of your physicians, always tell uh, your doctor that you're subject to an anti doping program and that there's a prohibited list. And whenever the, the doctor uh, prescribes something for you, always have him or her check the prescription and the ingredients within that prescription against the LPJ's prohibited list. That's the first thing, always, uh, that's the first kind of resort. Go to your physician, ask him or her if whatever you're taking is banned or not. Um, second, um, we provide a wallet card with the uh, with all of the LPJ prohibited substances. So if you're um, at a pharmacy and just curious about um, whether a drug that you want to take has banned substances or not, you can always check it against the list if you keep that card in your wallet. Um, another key resource is permitted medications list. This is a, a, a great list and I, I think it's underutilized in a lot of ways. Basically it's a, a list um, for common medical conditions like a, a cold, flu, nausea, asthma, antibiotics, pain, that type of thing um, with, with products that are, have actually been reviewed and cleared. So you know when you're when you're looking at the permitted, permitted medication list that if you want to take something on that list, it's, you're free and clear. There's no banned substances on, on, within those products. Another great resource um, we've uh, contracted with um, our testing agency, Drug Free Support, for a hotline and email service. So um, you can email um, lpga at drugfreesupport.com or call their hotline 1-877-285-1436. Um, and ask them over the phone um, or over email if, uh, if the product that you plan to take has banned substances or not. Another great resource is, um, is Drug Free Sports uh, website, www.drugfreesport.com backslash rec, R-E-C. On, on that site, you can, uh, you know, you can, for example, you can look up Tylenol. Say you have the pharmacy and you have your smartphone with you. You can look up Tylenol and it'll tell you whether it's banned or not. Tylenol's not banned. Um, and so those are great re resources for you. Like I said before too, you can always give me a call or shoot me an email um, and I, I'd be glad to help with that as well. All right, so the question now is, uh, what if you need to take a banned drug for a legitimate medical reason? And as we discussed earlier, the, the rule is um, that under the anti deafening program, you can't, you cannot take a banned drug. Uh, but the exception to that rule is uh, therapeutic use exception, or TED. And so the exception is you can take a banned drug if you satisfy three criteria, basically. If you have a significant health impairment that requires a banned drug, um, 
it, essentially that's it. If you can't function normally without banned drug, um, that no reasonable alternative drug exists in the market. Um, and so nowadays, many drugs treat the same problem. And really, if there's a drug out there that doesn't have a, a, a banned drug, um, you're supposed to use and try that first before you, uh, you actually use a banned drug. And third, um, you can't get an additional uh, performance enhancement by using the banned drug. And um, we, we'll talk about the TV process and the, the application uh, for that and, and, and on the next slide. Um, but for the purposes of explaining the TV now and this criteria, um, I'll, I'll use a, a attention deficit disorder example. Uh, say you have a, a player who um, is significantly impaired because of attention deficit disorder uh, and they need to use a drug to, to, to deal with that medical issue. Um, there are two drugs out there essentially that treat ADD, uh, a product called Stratera and a product called Adderall. Uh, Stratera um, doesn't have any you know, substances, but Adderall does. So under our uh, criteria, you would have to try to use Stratera first. And if it worked, that'd be great. You could, you could use a drug uh, without a banned substance and it'd be fine. If you used it and it, and it didn't um, have the effect, uh, based on your doctor's opinion, that it should have had, and you can show a documentation to back that up, and then you can use it. Uh, at all, uh, as long as uh, it doesn't give you any additional performance enhancement. Uh, so that, that's an example of uh, TV, and we'll move on to the next slide. Next, I want to go over a few uh, key tips for TVs, and really the first um, really important element here is um, that our TV system is based, it's a process based on submitting TVs proactively. Uh, so as we discussed before, um, we have a banned substance list. Um, players are, are expected to know what's in their bodies, um, and they're ultimately responsible for that. And um, and if a player is taking a banned drug, they have to submit a TUV um, prospectively before they compete in competition. Um, so I, I recommend that players submit uh, their TUV applications to me uh, before or 45 days before they plan to use that drug in competition. Um, and, and ultimately, if you tell us that you're using a drug on the day of competition, it's, it's way too late. Uh, and, and this is based on my own practical experience. And I've seen players um, you know, completely freak out, go white as a ghost, uh, because they, they're selected for testing. And they get to the testing site, and they all of a sudden realize that they're taking a product, um, and they haven't checked to see if it has been drugs or not. They completely freak out. Um, fortunately for, you know, for those players, um, they, they've taken drugs that, that weren't banned. But if, if they had taken a drug that was banned um, and, and they hadn't you know, researched it beforehand and known that it was um, that was banned, they would have been suspended in their program for using a banned drug without a valid TV. So I mean, again, this is a very serious component of the program. If you're taking a, a banned drug or planning to take a uh, banned drug, submit it to you before you participate in the competition. Uh, a couple more um, key areas here, uh, a couple of uh, just some important needs and values for the application purpose. Uh, we have EDC uh, to follow guidelines online um, at LPG.com and the Player Extranet in terms of how to fill out the application. Um, all, and really, when it comes down to it, your doctor can fill out almost all of the application for you. Um, we, we require that uh, your doctor provide um, medical documentation for the last 12 months uh, of when he or she is seeing you. There's also a $100 fee to submit um, a TV application. Confidentiality, uh, this is a very serious component for, for me and the LPGA. Um, either myself or Jennifer Farrington, the senior paralegal for the LPGA, see the application and the medical documents. Um, before we send the documents out to our TV doctors, which we'll talk about in a second, um, I, I, I redact all the personal identifying information so that the TV doctors will never know who you are and um, so that there's no chance for bias um, there. Also, um, I, I keep all the medical documents locked up um, in, in the cabinet so that nobody either inside the LPG or outside the LPG um, will ever have access to the information. The TV doctors really that are the, the crux of this TV program 
Um, we use uh, on a voluntary basis expert doctors with significant anti-doping experience. Some of our doctors have worked with the NFL, Major League Baseball, the Olympics, um, and, and our, we have a, a, a list of TV doctors, and I, I select three for a panel, uh, a TV panel, to review your application and your case, and they ultimately make a decision. Um, and if the TV panel denies your application, there is a, a, a last resort where you can appeal to a TV specialist. Um, so those are some of the key uh, items that we need to know to do these, and uh, we'll move on to the next slide. A few key items on testing that I want to review uh, quickly with you is, uh, first, our, our interdoping system is based on urine collection at this point. Um, we only collect urine samples, and um, we may collect blood samples in the, in the future, in the future, but we don't do that currently. Um, our, our system is based on in-competition testing, um, so that from the start of a, a tournament until the 12-hour period after each round, um, you may be selected for testing. Also, it's no notice um, testing. So, after you sign a, after you finish a round and, and sign your scorecard, uh, you may be approached at any point um, for for testing on any particular day. That also means you know you may be um, selected back to back days or, or two tournaments in a row, or you may only be selected one time in a season, or you may be selected five times or ten times. Um, but in any, in any event, it's, it's known as uh, testing. Um, also, uh, another key part here is if, if you actually violate the program and you're suspended, um, say, for a year on your first doping offense, for the six-month period before you're eligible to come back and compete as a member, um, you're subject to reinstatement testing, which, um, which means um, you can be tested out of competition anywhere um, at any time without notice. Uh, for the six month period before you come back as a member. So those are just a couple of the key items on testing. All right, so the uh, the next two slides are probably the two most important slides uh, in this presentation, so listen up now. Um, first here, how can you violate the, the policy? Um, there's a series of bullet points here, each one which which would uh, which could result in a violation uh, or a doping offense. Um, first, if, if you uh, provide a urine sample, it goes to the lab and comes back with a prohibited substance or method in the urine sample, that would be a reason uh, to charge a player with a doping violation. Second, if there's uh, reliable evidence of, of use or attempt of use through, for example, witness testimony, um, then that might be a reason uh, to charge a player with a, a doping offense. Um, evading or refusing the test. Um, an example here, uh, we had a player at one point who was selected for testing, came to the site and said, my favorite uh, football team is uh, is playing. I have plans with my family and friends to go to the bar. Um, and I, I just can't do this right now. Uh, we, we, we had to tell the player at that point that uh, if they refused to be tested or evaded the process, that they will be charged with a doping violation and face a one-year suspension. So the player, fortunately for her, ultimately stayed and, and, and provided a example. Another, uh, violation, uh, grounds for violation of the policy, tampering with any part of the doping control uh, process. This uh, uh, example here might be um, if you provide uh, you know, two samples, an A and B sample uh, of urine, the A sample and B sample go to the lab, A sample comes back with a prohibited substance in your, in your urine sample, you have under our, our uh, protocol, you have the ability to go to the, to the lab physically in person with a representative and watch the analysis of your B sample. If you went to the lab and took the B sample and smashed it on the ground, that would be an example of tampering with the doping control process because at that point there would be no way under the protocol to, to verify that the B sample confirmed the A sample, which is required under the protocol. Uh, possession of a prohibited substance or, or method. Uh, if, for example, you're going through customs in, in a certain country and we found a possessed a prohibited substance, um, and that could be grounds for violation of the protocol. Um, trafficking or attempted trafficking, which is a serious, can be a serious criminal offense also, uh, would be uh, grounds for a violation of the policy. Um, administering a, a prohibited substance or method to another player, also a violation of the policy. Uh, complicity in terms of encouraging or aiding or conspiring to use a banned drug or covering up the use of a banned drug. 
would be uh, grounds for a violation of the policy. Intentionally providing false information, um, say for example you, you submitted false information on your TV or you uh, went to a doctor uh, and either asked them or forced them to fabricate medical records so that you could get a, a TUV and use a banned drug without uh, without medical justification, that would be uh, grounds for a violation of the policy. And lastly, admitting uh, use uh, of a banned drug. An example here in the NBA a couple of years ago, uh, a guy named Josh Howard admitted um, to, a, to a newspaper that he uh, that he used marijuana and the NBA got caught wind of it and they ended up uh, giving Josh Howard a suspension for admitting use uh, of a Bang drug. So that would be another ground for violating the policy. As much as the last slide is critically important for understanding what constitutes a violation of the LPGA's anti doping policy, even more important are the penalties that would arise after you violate the policy. So this slide deals with the consequences basically of what happens after you violate the policy. And, um, I'll, I'll go through each suspension period uh, as you see on the slide, but I think before that, I think you always have to think about if you violate the policy from a from a PR, public relations, media perspective, dealing with tough questions from the media and essentially being labeled as a cheater, um, it, it could be devastating to your career and could definitely impact your marketing and endorsement deals. Um, but even more important from a monetary perspective, sitting out from the LPGA for a year or two years or permanently would have a huge negative uh, consequence uh, to the amount of income that you can make by participating on the LPGA tour. So I'll get to it right now. Penalties uh, for violating the policy. The first doping offense would result in a one-year suspension um, from uh, participating in an LPGA tournament competition. The second offense would be a two-year suspension and a loss of membership and earned exemption. So that would basically mean that you would have to go through Q school again, which I'm sure none of you want to do. And then lastly, uh, for the third doping offense, there's a permanent ban from LPGA tour membership. Um, and so also of note here is for each offense, that you would also get uh, disqualified from the tournament um, in which you were tested. Um, and you would forfeit prize money, rankings, points, titles, and any awards earned from those tournaments as well. So as we discussed previously, the, the penalty for performance enhancing drugs is different than the penalties for drugs of abuse. Again, drugs of abuse are uh, recreational street drugs like morphine, PCP, marijuana, etc. Uh, that if used would result in a major penalty under the uh, player conduct regulations of the LPGA tournament and player regulations. And within those regulations, the commissioner of the LPGA has the authority to, to determine the penalty within recommended guidelines uh, for a major penalty. And within those guidelines, it would be uh, usually a minimum $500 fine and up to a three month suspension. Uh, in addition to that, um, the commissioner uh, would have the ability to recommend that the player undergo rehab or some other type of drug treatment program, uh, since this would be more of an addiction issue than a performance enhancing issue. All right, so I, I quickly want to review a couple of key testing frequently asked questions uh, that have come up to me over the last couple of years from, from uh, players on tour. Uh, first one is why and how they're selected. Um, the LPGA program doesn't require justification to test any, any number at any time. Um, it is, for the most part, random selection, um, but players could be tested once or multiple times or back-to-back -back days or back-to-back -back tournaments. Uh, second question here, what if a player declines testing? The, uh, the football example we had um, earlier in this presentation where uh, a player wanted to go out and meet um, their family and friends for a, a football game. If, if you decline testing, um, we would take that as a refusable test or evading um, testing and um, it would result in a, a suspension of the program. Uh, do I need to go straight to the doping station or can I do something else? Under our program, uh, you have 60 minutes to report to the doping station after you um, complete your round and sign a uh, scorecard. Um, during that time, you can you can do almost anything you want. Um, you can eat, uh, work out, you know, practice, putt drive, 
anything like that. Um, but if you do have to to uh, urinate, uh, then you have to go straight to the different station. Um, as long as you stay on property, you can almost do whatever you want to do. Um, now, the 60 minutes can be extended if you have media obligations. What if I ever drink while on the course? What can I do? Um, the two key things that we, we, we tell players is one, to eat, um, because through the digestion and absorption process, um, by eating, it takes water out of your body, um, and you can usually provide a, a urine sample faster. Uh, also, working out, uh, if you sweat out the water in your body, it helps uh, if, you, if you're overhydrated. Uh, what do I need to bring to the doping station? Um, we recommend that you bring either your money clip or your your badge or your ID. Um, and really the thing here is for free sport our testing agency needs to be able to verify your identity um, when you show up to make sure it is you. Um, next question, can I bring my cell phone with me? Um, you, you can't uh, because the, the process of inside the doping uh, station is, is confidential and uh, we can't permit any audio or video devices inside the doping station. Um, can I bring anyone with me? Uh, the, the answer there is no unless um, unless you're a minor. Uh, if you're a minor, you can bring uh, your parent or guardian with you. Um, or if, um, if you need help with uh, or assistance with translation, um, if you don't speak English well, you can uh, bring a translator with you. In either case there, um, person who comes with you would have to sign a confidentiality form to protect the confidentiality of this process. A couple more questions uh, that aren't on the slide. Um, the test results usually take uh, 10 to 14 business days um, to get back from the lab. Um, if, if you are tested, uh, your, the money that you earn from a tournament, if any, um, is held by the OPJ with interest until your result is cleared. So yeah, if it comes back negative, no prohibited substances, your money would be released right then and there um, with interest. But if you if it came back positive, having a, a prohibited substance in your sample, um, it wouldn't be released um, ever if, if you're found guilty of a doping violation. Or if, if, you, if you're at some point um, not, not guilty of a doping violation, it would then be released with interest. Um, if you're uh, penalized, you can uh, defend your, yourself in the arbitration appellate uh, process uh, that we have in our report. All right, so this next slide deals with supplements and uh, deals with a couple of common questions that I receive uh, from players each year. So the first question is, how do you know if a product is a supplement or not? And uh, for me, I, I look at the packaging and it says supplement facts. That means it's, it's a supplement, as opposed to if it says nutrition facts, that would be a, a normal food product. Um, so the next question here is, if you go to a GNC or another um, similar type of store, and pick up a supplement that doesn't specifically list a banned substance, is it safe to take? And uh, the answer there is no. Um, as you'll see on, on any supplement packaging, uh, it has a standard disclaimer that says that um, supplements are, are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And, and what this basically means is that um, supplements have not undergone the thorough uh, and extensive testing and inspection that are normally required by the FDA. And the result there is that some studies have actually shown that up to 25% of supplements have been contaminated. Um, in some of those uh, those cases, there have been steroids, um, stimulants, and other banned drugs that were actually um, showed up in supplements. So the, the key takeaway here is that the label of a supplement is not always guaranteed to be accurate, um, that there might be additional substances, some of which might be banned under the OPJ's anti-doping program, that might actually be in the supplement um, uh, that, that you plan to take. Um, and, and some pro athletes have actually tested positive using supplements. Um, so you take supplements at your own risk. Um, now, the, the last question here is, if you plan to take a supplement, what, what can you do to ensure that it's clean? And uh, what I normally tell players is, um, there is a program out there um, by a company called NSF, and they have a Certified for Sport uh, program, which basically um, certifies that, the, that the, the, um, the substances in the supplement product are, are clean. Um, and so they've uh, partnered with uh, other sports like the NFL, Major League Baseball, and the WTA, uh, Women's Tennis Association, 
um, and, and so athletes in those sports um, take NSF uh, products um, based on NSF's um, uh, representations that their, their products are clean. Um, and uh, alternatively, if NSF doesn't have um, your type of supplement product, uh, they, they do offer uh, a program where you can send, for example, a batch of your supplements to NSF and they can test just your batch um, to make sure that your batch is clean. Um, I should point out that there is a fee to do that that you'd have to pay to NSF. Um, alternatively, in, in terms of using supplements, um, you, you could work with uh, the OPJ's medical director, uh, Bruce Thomas, um, or Dr. Andrews, um, or, or a nutritionist, um, and, and, uh, and, and look at um, you know, food programs um, that you could take to get the same benefits as taking a supplement. Um, and, and in some cases, you can get better better benefits by using you know, normal food products than, than using supplements. So I'd encourage you to look into that option as well. All right, and that was my uh, last slide for this uh, LPGA anti-doping webinar. Uh, I just want to remind you that um, there are a couple of questions uh, that we'd like you to answer uh, after viewing this presentation uh, to verify that you've watched this presentation. Uh, additionally, uh, as, I, uh, as I talked with you all earlier, uh, if you have any questions at any time, always feel free to give me a call or send me an email, and I'd be happy to help you out. Thanks for listening.